Alright, so I'm excited uh, to introduce Libby Barnes. Uh, Libby is an associate professor from Colorado State University, uh, and she was actually one of my mentors when I was a graduate student there. And even today, I will still continue to snag little bits of wisdom from her. Um, she got her PhD from the University of Washington in 2012, uh, so she's a fellow U, U Dub. <laughs> Alumnus, various other faculty here. Post UW, right? Mm -hmm. a long discussion about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> distinction is important. Yeah. Um, and since then, she has had a very successful career. Um, she has most recently received the AMS Clarence Leroy Messenger Award for 2020. So it's so recent, it hasn't even happened yet. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, and uh, she also received an NSF career in 2018. Uh, she also wears many hats. Uh, so I'll just mention a couple of those hats so that we're not here all day. Uh, she is the uh, task force lead for the NOAA MAP S2S Prediction Task Force, which there's several people in this building that do work associated with that. Um, and she's also the lead for the U.S. CLIVAR Working Group on emergency da Emerging Data Science Tools for Climate Variability and Predictability, which it sounds like this is very much relevant, um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, so with that, um, I will let you take over. All right, thank you everybody for being coming. I think I visited years ago, right, when I was starting my faculty position, so um, I hope this, I can guarantee this is a different talk if you were still here. Um, I actually know Madison pretty well. My sister got her degree here in Madison, but I was a gopher. So she would send us tickets whenever, the, the tickets to the game, whenever the Badgers beat the Gophers, which was all the time. Um, but actually, she still lives here, so I get to come back to Madison quite a bit, but not to this department, so it's really an honor to be here. So today, I'm going to talk to you about new work, and by new, I mean most of it hasn't been published, but it's been written up. So if there are things that are exciting or things you hate, let me know, because there's actually an opportunity to do something about it. Um, it also means it's relatively new, so you're going to get energy from me that maybe from that talk I've given 20 times you wouldn't get, but we'll also, we're going to get through it together, okay? Um, and this is really this new passion. People say, you know, every seven years you're supposed to sort of reinvent yourself. And, and I feel like, you know, I, I do large-scale climate dynamics, um, and that, I still do that, but I, I really secretly have always been a nerd for tools and data analysis. There's a new word for this, data science, which I realize makes some of you probably cringe. Um, but I, I really love how, how do we extract information from the vast amounts of data we have, both observations and models. And today I want to introduce you to some of the tools that we're starting to use in my group to do this. Many of you here maybe are already using these tools. You hear AI, that's sort of the sexy way of saying it, right? There's also machine learning, or as I will introduce you to, regression. <laughs> not linear regression, okay? Um, and just, and, and I'll, I'll frame it. I'm going to assume you don't know anything about this. So if you do, you, I'll tell you when you can take a little nap. Um, but hopefully, my goal of this talk is actually not to say go read my paper. My goal of this talk is you will leave with, if you didn't, if you weren't aware of these tools, with just a little bit more excitement that, that these tools could be useful for you in your, in your field. And I think that, that's what I really love. Okay, so here's my little robot. One of my grad students made this for me. <laughs> Thinking, learning about atmospheric science here. Okay, so it's really important I point out the people I'm working with on this project. Um, this is work I definitely have not been doing alone. So my PhD student, Ben Toms, is a big player in this work. Jamin Rader is a new master's student. And then um, the suite of people on the bottom who I've been working quite closely with um, on, on the paper, one of the papers I will present to you. And I want to point out that this is, if you will, somewhat interdisciplinary in the sense that we have um, someone, sort of a software engineer, a computer science faculty, of course climate science, and I also fall into that category, and then someone who really is a data scientist. And part of the reason this project took two years to do is when I did it, which if you know what life as a faculty member is like, it means you had 20 minutes every three weeks, I feel like. But also because we had to learn to speak the same language. And that took a long time. Um, for example, Emma spent over a month and a half using the word graph until I realized she wasn't talking about an XY plot, but was actually talking about two blobs with an arrow between them. So it's just a totally different world. 
um, domain scientist, if you've heard that phrase, made me think of a specific geographical domain, like I study North America. Turns out I'm a domain scientist and you're a domain scientist because we study the domain of atmospheric science. So all of these little vocab things got us quite confused early on. All right. So machine learning for geoscience. Um, many of us, at least me, used to think about it like this, a black box. So your data comes in, magic happens, and then some prediction comes out. And this makes a lot of us pretty uncomfortable because as scientists, we are not happy with black boxes. We want to know why. And so there's a great XKCD comic, if you haven't seen it, that says, is this your machine learning system? And yep, you just pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then collect the answers on the side. Are wrong. You just stir it until it starts looking right. Okay, so this is sort of the feeling you might have about machine learning. And again, I definitely did at the beginning. And now, now that I see it's actually, at least the way we're using it, just nonlinear regression, it's, it's not nearly this cryptic anymore. So these many techniques that fall under the realm of machine learning have been used in, in you know, outside of science. Um, so ideas like finding out where the cat and the dog are. Um, and and these, these techniques, and I'll go through them, have also already been applied to our field in various ways. These are just some examples. So for example, you can take cat and dog and turn it into pattern classification for extreme weather events. Find the hurricanes or find the atmospheric rivers. You can take res uh, super resolution and fusion and think about downscaling and blending. Okay? And you can think about video prediction and turn that into something like short-term forecasting, which I know this is like Google Live. Excited about right now. But also, um, recent work has done a lot of work with convective parameterizations. And I would say, when you hear about machine learning and atmospheric science, this may be the thing you think of first. Okay, we're going to take our parameterizations of convection, try to have them learn from something that does convection well, put it into a big GCM with big, big grid cells that doesn't do convection well, and maybe we'll get some bang for our buck. And there's quite a bit of work that has come out in the last year and a half just very exciting stuff showing this might actually be maybe feasible. Um, and then also starting to look, this is just um, Ghani et al. 2019, looking at predicting the probability of extreme hail, so more of an uh, NWP framework. I say all this, but I'm actually not going to talk about any of this. I just wanted to set the scene for, there's a lot of work being done in our field of machine learning. Um, but I, I, I'm actually not an expert on any of these topics. Most of my dynamics involve dry dynamics, I feel like. So pretend moisture doesn't exist. So clouds are not a thing in my world. Okay. Instead, um, what we're really doing is thinking about how to separate the signal from the noise. So this is a signal-to-noise problem, which as scientists, most of us are dealing with in some way or another. And so the atmosphere is noisy across time scales, and separating that's the signal from the noise obviously is not easy. It's why we have jobs. So on the weather time scales, it could be trying to understand teleconnections on weekly time scales emits the sea of noise, or a nearly to multi-decadal variability can interfere with, say, identifying the human influence on climate. And this is the type of setting that I'm interested in applying these techniques. So we have lots of tools to do these things already. For example, we can look for a signal by fitting a line through a time series. That's, that's a tool. We do that all the time. Um, we might use uh, frequency analysis to look at the spectra and find the, you know, certain, certain modes that oscillate at specific frequencies to identify the signal in the noise. And um, in climate, we often use empirical orthogonal functions or EOF analysis to define modes of variability. And that's a way to get our signal in the noise. And what I want to suggest here is I'm merely thinking about using these techniques as yet another tool for my toolbox. It's not going to change the, my world. It's not going to suddenly have all answers where I couldn't have them before, but it's just adding yet another tool to the ones I already have. And in some cases, some of the things we're interested in is, in is knowing when it doesn't do any better than our original methods did in the first place. That would be nice to know. Okay, so to set up the problem, um, we're going to look at mostly throughout this talk thinking about climate change in the 21st century. All right, so this is a picture of the change in temperature between the end of the 21st century and um, the early 20th century. So this is also, the, so this is across the CMIP-5 climate models, and it's averaged over many climate models. So this is the mean sort of change in temperature. 
and we see our typical picture of reds everywhere. Things are going to get warmer on average across all these models when you average out a lot of the noise. Um, the Arctic warms much faster than the rest of the globe. That's Arctic amplification. Um, and you see the lands warming faster than the ocean. Okay, so most people are probably familiar with this, this type of plot. Now, what you don't see in this plot is the way I've plotted it here, is there are a bunch of types of uncertainty that aren't showing up in there. And the three types I'll talk about here are first, scenario uncertainty. What, what are humans going to do? And well, what, what have we done? Sometimes it's still unknown. And what are we going to do, say, with CO2 as an example? And we, unless we know that, we may not, we don't actually know what to put into our climate models to actually simulate the response. Um, so just to show that, if you look at different climate scenarios, um, and if you look at the blue and the red, the blue being a, a less extreme future and the red being a more extreme future, the difference between the red and the blue is really encapsulating what humans do with CO2 and, and greenhouse gases, and that's that scenario uncertainty. Another type of uncertainty is structural model uncertainty, also known as you know, simulating the physics of our atmosphere. And what that is, is even within this red curve, you see this spread. And this is showing the differences across climate models and their response. And the fact that they're different, or, you know, very different in their, their final temperature response, is largely due to the fact that these are just different models that were coded up by different people run on different machines. Okay, but there's a third type of uncertainty, and that's internal variability. And this is nicely shown in this stamp plot. <coughs> Um, looking at the CESM-1 large ensemble. So each of these simulations was run with exactly the same climate model, in almost all cases, even on the same hardware. And all they did was add perturbations to the 1850 initial conditions in surface temperature. So they only perturbed surface temperature, nothing else. And they perturbed it by 10 to the minus 14th Kelvin, which was the equivalent of the round-off error of that. That's their, their hardware, okay? And these are the different worlds they got from just running 30 of those with ever so slightly different initial conditions. So if you will, this is the butterfly effect on climate time scales. The idea that the initial conditions will lead to very different end results. And these are trends over 1979 to 2012, and we see there are some things about them that are very similar. For example, the Arctic is red in many of them, showing that the Arctic is warming. And this is something consistent across these ensemble members, implying that this is something that's been forced. At the same time, if you look at your favorite location, we could look here. You know, in some cases, the Midwest is cooling over that period. In other cases, it's warming. Okay, and that's that internal variability of that noise. And the problem we deal with, of course, is that the real world looks like this over the same time period. And how do we really know which of these blobs are the force blobs, and which of these blobs are just due to internal variability. Because this could be thought of as just one of these. And actually, Gen K is sneaky and hides it in the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> okay, <laughs> to show you that, that you may not have even noticed that something was different. But that's the observations, the rest are just one single climate model. So the question is, how can we tell which patterns are signal and which are noise in our one observed ensemble member? Right, we can't average 30 Earths together and say, oh, look, finally we found the force response. If we could do that, many of us would have probably different careers. Okay, so this is where tools come in, and, and there are many tools to do this, and again, I just want to introduce one. Um, so we're going to go to Neural Networks 101. So, typically we think of this, we're going to input a picture of a dog, like some sort of <laughs> Google example, right, image processing, and we want to input a picture, and we want this neural network to output what kind of animal. All right, but I, I'm actually going to show you an example here where I don't really care what the animal is. I'm going to show you, I've set up the problem, I don't care what this is. I, I have to tell it to do something. But what I care about is how did it know it was a dog? What made a dog a dog? Was it the ears? Was it the nose? Was it the blue background? Okay. And if I can learn what made it a dog, maybe I can learn some science even if the actual prediction was somewhat useless, okay? And if that doesn't make any sense, hopefully the next few slides will come okay? All right, so how are we gonna do this? And by the way, 
looking inside the black box is something, even a few years ago, the computer science community was saying, Could, we, we can't really do this, we won't get it. And I would say in the last two years, there have been huge strides in explainable AI. Can we explain what it learned? And I, I will introduce some tools that I think are really exciting for our field to do science. So if you're not familiar, who here knows how the inner workings of a neural network? Great. Okay, this is what it's 101. You all can nap. I told you I'd tell you can do that. Okay, so I'm just going to focus on a neural network. The machine learning encompasses many, many different tools. All I'm doing today is neural networks. Okay? And here's the idea. We have inputs, two different values as an example. And they each are associated with the weight. This, by the way, is the way you draw it. It's very important to learn how to draw these. It helps you communicate with computer scientists. Okay? Now, the way you read this is it's just linear regression. X1 gets multiplied by W1. X2 gets multiplied by W2. It goes into this blue blob, and they get summed. And then you add, if you will, a y-intercept also called the bias unit, if you're in computer science again, okay? That's everything up until this point. This is just regression. So if I were to hide this piece, this would literally output y equals a linear regression problem with, with two inputs, okay? Now what makes a neural network able to do such amazing things is this, this step here is where you apply a nonlinear function that allows it to not be linear anymore. In this case, this is a step function, but I could also, um, I will show you, there, there are lots of different nonlinear functions one could apply here, okay? Um, and all you do is you take this input, push it through this nonlinear, also known as an activation function, and that's your y, that's what's output, okay? So, this doesn't look that impressive at all. Again, if your activation function is y equals x, if it's just linear, then this is just linear regression. Okay, but now imagine I have a lot of these, and I have a lot of these. And they're all adding things up with different weights, pushing them through something nonlinear, adding them up in other combinations here, pushing them through something else nonlinear. Those nonlinear things then go to a new blob that get weighted with different weights that all get added up and pushed into something nonlinear, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, this neural network is able to approximate very, very nonlinear things with just linear stuff with this little activation function. So that's all we're doing. We're just multiplying by weights and, and really adding things together, okay? But it gets complex fast. And the, the beauty of, of what's happened in machine learning over the last 10 years has really been, how do we learn those Ws? How do I figure out what those Ws and those Bs are to actually get the right thing out at the end? And I'm not gonna go into that here, but I'm happy to chat about it at the end. Okay. So now, that's enough of an overview. Let's actually get into what we did, okay? Here's what we did. I am going to input a map of annual mean surface temperature. Looks something like this. Each grid point is a different input. So I'm gonna, or a different input node. So I'm gonna input this whole map and just turn it into a vector. People that have dealt with data like this know exactly what, you know, take your lat longs and you just make them into one long line, right? Okay? And what do I want it to do? I want it to guess the year that this map is from. So I told you I wasn't going to care about if it was a dog. I will tell you why I don't care what year it is, because I know what year it is. My net CDF file told me that the, you know, the fifth time step is 1923. Okay, I know it's 1923. But what's going to be interesting is if it can predict the year from a single map, then it had to learn something that made this map identifiable as that year. And that's where some interesting science is gonna come in. So if I can figure out what it did with those weights, those Ws inside, <coughs> I can actually learn what was the identifier for that year. Mm -hmm. Make some sense? Okay, well, we'll step through it. All right, so step one is, and if you care, it's actually a very shallow network. We didn't need it to be too deep, but it's two hidden layers with 10 units each. So we just have two of these with 10 blue blocks each. Okay. So, first, well, this is not the first thing we did, but you know how when you write a paper, you step everybody through as though you did everything in a certain order? Yeah. So the first thing we do now is we're gonna put in data we know will fail miserably, just to make sure we understand what we're doing. So we are going to take 
a long control simulation with constant 1850 forcing every year looks exactly the same except for internal variability. There's no CO2 forcing, there are no volcanoes going off. This is just one long control run, okay? And we're gonna input maps. This is the actual year of that map where I mapped, they're all 1850, but I just said, okay, this one's gonna be called 1920, 1921, 1922, but there's nothing actually about 1922 special to that map. This is what I input, and this is what the neural network after it trained gets. So the gray dots are the training data, the data it used to learn the right answer. That's the gray. And if you could just looked at the gray for a minute, you'd say, wow, this neural network's amazing. It got the, it got the year perfectly right. This is great. But the black is data I withheld. And after my neural network was trained, I then said, okay, let's see how you do on data you've never seen before. Okay? So I pushed that data through. And as you can see, it's an absolute disaster. So why did it do so well in the gray dots, the training data? It overfit. It has so many tunable parameters, it was easy, easily able to overfit the data. When I gave it maps that it had never seen before, it failed miserably. Yeah? To be, to be sure here, you're training the data on the 1850 control simulation. Yep, but then I withheld some of that control simulation. Yep, so there's nothing to learn. Why is there nothing to learn? Because there's nothing consistent from year to year that tells you what year it is. Okay, so. Going back to our picture, the neural network has to be able to learn regional signals that are reliable indicators of the year. Okay, there's nothing reliable that were indicators of the year from a control simulation. But let's think for a second, under say climate change, uh, if it gets hotter, it's probably not 1920 if it's really hot, right? There, there's differences between 1920 and 2000 and 2100 that we all sort of have in Yep. So for the test you did, yep. you said you wanted to train it, uh, use data that it hadn't, that you knew that this test was going to fail. I did. What yep. would have been a surprise? Um, so this is a yep. test, so what's the... So I wanted, uh, the about? surprise was going to be actually <laughs> if it did do okay on the black dots, on the, right. the testing data, it would tell me that my model, my control simulation had drift and that there was actually, that the model itself was drifting one direction or the other and that certain years were actually identifiable as happening later than others because the model wasn't actually sticking at 1850. Yeah. Okay, I actually do that, really. I do it as a test. I do this so your brain knows what a bad answer looks like, and now I'll show you what we actually got, and you will have something to compare it to. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is what we did get. So this is where the gray dots, which you cannot see, our CMIP-5 models that we trained on, and the colored dots, which are what you can't see, are the CMIP-5 models the neural network never saw before. So we pushed it through after we thought we had the right answer. Okay, yep? Did you train on the same models and leave a model out, or did you train on all models? Uh, no, but neither. We, so we had 30 models, and we trained on 22, and eight were totally separated. And then the colored dots were the eight you see. We didn't do a leap one out, we just we left eight out and did it. And one thing we did have to make sure is places like GFDL like to output multiple models that are just slightly different. So we needed we did make sure that we weren't just actually training on the same model. So, yeah. Okay, yep. Maybe I'm jumping the gun, but could you explain why is the variance of ours? Yeah, I gotta give my talk here. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, totally. Okay, there's a ton to see here. It's super cool. Um, at least to me, obviously, I'm here. Um, so, why, first of all, do you see how this is sort of flat? And then it angles up. Now, I will tell you, the computer scientist said, oh, it's sort of not working here, we need to tweak things. And I said, no, there's nothing to learn yet. The signal is so tiny in this early time period of the 20s and 30s. It has nothing to hold on to. It's almost like this is a control simulation. But then somewhere around the 60s, it goes, aha, I found something useful. I found an indicator. And it gets better and better and better. OK? So that's why, that's why the variance is different here. So as a scientist, I'm actually really excited that it did this. Because it means there's a signal that emerged at some point. Now. <coughs> Here's what actually, and I will tell you, this has all been really fun, but the thing that I'm still very surprised about is we said, okay, we now have this box with, that knows how to take a temperature map and tell me the year. We have this thing called observations 
that gives us maps of surface temperature. What happens if I put in an observed map of surface temperature? Can you tell me what year it is? And I'll tell you, when, when I was suggested by my colleague to do this, I said, it's going to fail miserably because we all know climate models have huge biases. Like how, how could it actually get the real world right? Um, and I can go into more detail, but I think the fact that we're training over many CMIP-5 models with many different types of biases is quite helpful. So this is observations. And if you said, I don't believe that this is learning anything useful, the point is it's never seen observations other than the fact that the people that made the climate models were thinking about observations when they were making sure their parameters were right. Yeah? So are these observations or analyses? Um, well, these are, these are the Berkeley observations of surface temperature. So it's not no longer a map that you're putting in? It's Here I am putting in a map, and I'm only doing it after the time period where they have full coverage over the globe. Um, I'm not sure what the, the Berkeley now, what is that Berkeley? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, I would call it an analysis. Real analysis. Yeah, 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 it's a real analysis, okay, okay. but it's different than, say, era interim. Yeah. Um, so the point is, the dots aren't all that bad. It generally gets the right year which to me is still very surprising, okay? Not only that, but the years go up, like in an order. Are they perfect? Ab no, absolutely not. But honestly, I wouldn't expect them to be because 2012 and 2013 aren't that distinguishable from each other, okay? Now, uh, well, sorry, one more thing. I did mention the control run. The control run's actually really useful now because we can say, what if we push through the control run? What years does it think it is? Remember that control run that's always 1850 all the time? So if we push, let's see, oh, going the wrong way here. If we push that through, this is what we get. So this is the same plot with the gray. And it says, it knows that after about 1945, the control run could never have existed in these years. These are all tests to make sure, again, that our intuition isn't out to lunch. This was us making sure that it was doing what we thought it was doing. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Um, hold on. Oh, yeah, so this is testing. Again, notice that they diverge at some point here, where they become different, and the neural network knows it. Okay, now, I am guarantee at least one person in this room is unimpressed, because they said that you're thinking, it's just taking the global mean temperature, which gets warmer every year, give or take, okay? And we were really worried, this fancy nonlinear functional estimator was literally averaging all the grid points together over my map, and saying, oh, it's hotter this year than that year, so it must be later. So what we did is every map we fed in, we first subtracted the global mean. So it cannot learn the global mean temperature. It has to learn regional contrasts, okay? And this is, uh, and I can't get in the button, but this is what we get. So I will point out, I thought this was gonna look like the control simulation, actually. I thought I was gonna just fail miserably. It's not as good, but it's not that bad in the grand scheme of things. It's learning something. A few really interesting things to point out. First, the blue. This is one particular model that has a delayed pattern response. Even though it looks fine here, when you remove that mean, it says its pattern of warming is similar to that of the other models, or it wouldn't get the years in the right order. But it's delayed by multiple decades compared to the other models. Yeah, go ahead. So did you, did you remove the mean prior to the training on this one? Yes, everything. So it's training and testing always with a zero mean map. Thank you. Yep. The second thing you'll notice is OBS. First, it's still in the right order, which is pretty cool. But you notice how it's been shifted about 20 years later. It says that based not on the global mean temperature, but on those regional patterns of warming, it knows that the years go in this order, but the observations of things are about 15 to 20 years ahead of where the climate models were. And remember, it could only learn what the climate models told it. You know, the OBS are just something that are pushed through at the very end. Um, some could say that means that the real world's warming faster, but I, I'm gonna be careful there, because this is with the whole temperature response, and this is the, the, the patterns. Okay, so. Does it say yeah. that the patterns are amplifying faster? Well, it could, except our method is nonlinear, so it allows those patterns to be different for every year. And that's one of the things that I'm excited about this, this method. It's not saying global warming looks like this, and it's just amplified. For example, I'm someone that thinks about the ozone hole, and that's a different pattern, 
than CO2, which is a different pattern than aerosols over at Eastern Asia. And this method could pick up all of those at different times of year. And um, I will show you that in a few slides. Okay. So quickly, I do want to point out that actually we started this work without the CMIP-5 models. We just used the large ensemble of CESM1. We had 40 members in that case. And so we trained over 80% of them, tested over the other 80%, and we didn't have to deal with the fact that the models were all different. This was the same model with just internal variability. The problem was, it did awesome on both the training and testing data, but horrible with the observations. So what's going on here? What's going on is, the neural network is doing such a good job learning CESM1, that we know the models have biases. Like, that's no surprise. And I'm not trying to be mean to see them, well, by the way. All models have biases. But it's learning it so well that it's doing great also with the testing data that's never seen. But the point is, it's learning things that are almost too detailed that are just wrong about the observations. It's bringing out the biases. And the beauty is, and this is something that did surprise me, but we now in retrospect make sense, by training over the CMIP-5 models that are so different, the neural network was only able to to use the patterns that robust across all of them. And those very, very robust patterns also appear to be relevant to the real world too. too. Yeah. So you can use that to your advantage, it would seem to me. You could, you could figure out how the climate model's physics or formulation is sensitive to screwing up the observations, Absolutely. right? Totally. And actually what we're doing right now is, uh, as I left the office on Friday, um, I'm downloading three other large ensembles. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions could be, which large ensemble actually learn when it learns itself does a better job with the observation. So that's one of, you can start to do some of your comparisons. Okay, um, so I will just tell you one quick thing, and I, I won't dwell too long on this, but one thing that's been fascinating to me is this elbow. When does it find something? Um, some people call this time of emergence. I will be careful. Uh, we are not distinguishing human CO2. We are just saying, Whatever's in the model, there's something that identifies it. So we're being a little bit careful. We're calling it identifying patterns of change. Okay, just to be careful, because the attribution world is a, is a different beast. So we, we have developed a method that's very simple that in essence looks for when the model knows that the year is different than some baseline year. Like, hey, when could this not have been 1940 anymore? Um, and we can calculate that and come up with a plot like this. So this is for the globe years. And this is over many different trained neural networks, over many different samples of te testing and training over different combinations of models. And this is the year when the network finally says, ah, there's a signal here. And one of the, the ideas here is as early in one of the setups, as early as the 1950s, it's able to identify a regional pattern of change that make it different than the 40s or the 20s. Okay, and you can do this for many different regions, the southern astrotropics, Antarctica, Arctic, the tropics, and you can start playing games like, okay, maybe not surprisingly, um, the Arctic, if you will, emerges later than the whole globe. You will notice that when you go to smaller scales, it becomes harder to identify a pattern of change, which makes sense. The purple boxes, by the way, are when you use our method on just a single model. And it says that um, when you use a single model, it's only dealing with internal variability, so things emerge earlier in the year. And you can play lots of games with this. Um, so I will tell you, we had one reviewer who got nervous and said, yeah, OK, so you're identifying patterns of change, but um, what about volcanic eruptions? Those aren't, you can't really call those patterns of change per se, right? But um, they're, they're still in the model. So what do we do? So I will show you just looking. So this is as early as the 1800s. Um, volcanic eruptions are in the green. And I'm starting to train at the moment over 1920. So here, so there are certainly volcanic eruptions that have big impacts on global mean surface temperature. And so perhaps our neural network is just going, oh, I know it's 1991 because Mount Pinatubo went off. Okay, so we did test that, and, and the answer is it's actually not learning that because we have a very shallow network. We haven't given it the opportunity to learn something as detailed as a volcanic eruption in a given year. But one of the fun things we can do is I can show you that. So this is the error, how wrong it was in the year. 
for a different model, and this is that year. And what you can see is it's humming along. The, this is the, the black is the mean over all the model simulations. It's humming along, and here's Mount Pinatubo erupting. The globe cools, and instead of learning that, it goes, oh, it must be about 15 years earlier, because the globe got, globe got cooler by about 15 degrees. Okay, oh, sorry, 15 years, wrong, no. 15 years, which is a weird place for temperature. But anyway, and then we see that recover again over the time scale, technically five to seven years for global temperatures to, to recover after an eruption. And just showing you that if you look at the red or the blue curve, this is across the scene of the five models after volcanic eruptions, and it takes you know, five years or so to come back. So I actually, I show this just to say, our neural network is not learning volcanic eruptions. It could, but we would have to make it much um, deeper, more layers, more of those blue blobs. Okay. Even, even with just surface temperature input? With just surface temperature input. Yeah. What about, uh, do I think it could learn it? Yeah. Oh, I mean, with enough data, absolutely. Do I think it could learn it in just with the CMET 5 models we have? Maybe. Maybe. But I think that we would have overfitting issues elsewhere, for example, with observations. Okay. Now you might still say, I'm not that impressed. This is temperature. Temperature has like the biggest is the biggest climate signal we've been talking about. Like, it is the, the, the poster child of climate change. So I will show you, we've done this with precipitation as well. So this is model precipitation. Don't get me wrong, and we can argue about how good that is. But um, this is the results for precipitation. Again, I thought this was going to look like the control simulation because precip is noisy. It's really noisy. This, by the way, is with the mean removed. Turns out there isn't that big of a mean change anyway. But this is, it's finding patterns. And the black or the white circles are GPCP. It doesn't look anywhere near as good as temperature, but I will argue you see a general up, and it somehow knew that this year was earlier than this year, which was earlier than that year. So it was picking up something, and the only thing it could learn from were the climate model patterns. Um, you might say, okay, so now you're, you know, this is cool. But you're using this big tool, this neural network, how could I have done with just linear regression? Like, I just told you that neural networks are just nonlinear regression. What if I took out the nonlinear part and made the whole thing just a linear equation? And this is what I would get otherwise. So the nonlinearities for precipitation are important. I will tell you for temperature, it's a lot more like the nonlinear one. Temperature is much more linear. But for precip, what it's saying is whatever pattern is important, you can't just scale that up. It's not just that times two for 2000, and that times five for 2040, and that times six for 2080. Um, there are nonlinearities in there. Okay, and again, just showing you the control run, these also separate, in this case, around the 80s in the, in the simulation. Um, okay, and uh, we can do that more quantitatively, and if you look at the globe, at the blue, it looks like we find um, the precip patterns emerging as early as the 1980s but on average across many combinations around 2000 for these patterns. Okay, so I told you we were gonna learn some science, but actually I haven't really told you any science yet other than the neural network can predict the year that we already knew in the first place. So now it's really, this is the part that I think is really exciting and is very new and is stuff we're thinking about actively in my group, which is how do we explain what we just did? Okay, and can we learn something new from it? So the question here is, what weights are being learned in the middle that allow it to take a map and turn it into a year? And to do that, I will not be going into the details. We are working on a, a paper, however, to explain this method to atmospheric scientists, because I will tell you that the computer science versions are incredibly complicated and their five papers in three years disagree with each other drastically. So we are attempting to, to interpret this for our field, and that paper is being led by my graduate student, Ben Toms, um, and should be submitted very soon, it's in the next few weeks. So what does it do? This is a picture of a neural network up here. You push everything through, and then once you get some prediction, say in my case 1923, it then says what made, what in the input made it guess 1923? So what their terminology is, it propagates the relevance backwards to the input, such that at the end, all of these values add up to 1923, if you will. 
give or take. So how much of 1923 came from this grid point? How much of 1923 came from that grid point? Now, this is like a regression map, except it's a lot, it's, it's, it can be interpreted that way, but you have to be careful because there's a lot of nonlinear stuff going on in here that's not perfectly treated the way a linear regression map is. But at least you can look at it that way, which I think in our field at least, we're very used to looking at maps with blues and reds on them. That's something we can do, okay? So is this, excuse yep. me, is this backward propagation, is it also through a nonlinear set of functions or is it? It is, it's through, it's through the exact same network. The, the question with the activation functions is, um, it's through the same everything. The only difference with backpropagation is backpropagation is trying to update those weights and biases. And in this case, we're doing backpropagation, but we've frozen our weights and biases. So we're just trying to learn what those values, uh, how they propagated <laughs> forward in the first place. So is an appropriate analogy, yeah. or could an analogy be, uh, like if this were some sort of nonlinear forecast model, uh -huh. this is akin to like an adjoint. Yes, and we had, I had that conversation with John. Exactly, except it can be not linear. Yes, exactly. And again, there are issues with it. I'm happy to discuss those. We are finding more of them every day. But it's the best tool out there that we have found. Okay? What it does then is it says, why did it give you that prediction of 1923? Okay. So as a quick example, um, before we launch into my example, ben, ben put this together. Imagine we're trying to, we input SSTs, and we're trying to predict the sign of the Nino 3.4 index. In essence, is it La Nina or El Nino? Okay. We can then do our back, our relevance <coughs> propagation, and do something like, hey, when I input SSTs in the shading for May 1998, the contours show why the neural network thought this was an East Pacific El Nino. It was looking here. Now you might be not that impressed, but of course it looked there. And actually, that's the point. It's not doing anything crazy. It's doing exactly what you hope it would do. It's looking where the SSTs are big. But what's neat and unlike linear regression is it's not looking for one single SST map. It's able to learn that there are Central Pacific El Ninos that are different from these. <coughs> and it knew for this prediction to look here. Okay? So it's just a really silly example. No one's going to pay us the big bucks to do this, okay? <laughs> but now we can use this type of method and apply it. Um, yeah. So, and this is, okay, I'll move to that. Okay, so remember this is our problem. Before I apply layer-wise relevance propagation, I do want to show you that this is what the linear regression pattern looks like when I try to do this linearly. And it's sort of a mess, okay? And I will talk, if, you're, if, if you've done this stuff before and you're wondering, about regularization, I'm happy to talk in detail about that later, okay? But this is what it looks like, it's sort of hard to interpret in the first place. And this, you get one pattern, one linear regression map. If you play with regularization, you can make it look like this. And then you start to say, oh, this region might be sort of important to this region, okay? But layer-wise relevance propagation can give you a map that can be looked at in the same way as a linear regression map. And actually, in some cases, you'll see it pulls out similar regions of importance. For example, the Western US, um, Eastern China comes out, uh, or some other regions, North Atlantic. Okay. One thing with relevance is it doesn't give you sign, S-I-G-N, by the way, sign. It tells you what was relevant, not whether it made it go up or down. Okay. But here's what you cannot do with linear regression. Now I, this is a summary of all of this. I can now make maps, what made it 1985? What made it 2075? And because this is a nonlinear function, these don't have to look anything like each other. So I will tell you, I am still racking my brain looking. I think I'm seeing, I think, ozone depletion and recovery in the earlier part of the 21st century. But it hasn't been popping out as nicely as I thought, so I'm, this is a hypothesis I had. I thought during the 90s and the 2000s, ozone was going to be the thing that helped it identify what was going on. And then as we went later into the 21st century, it would be the CO2, the global warming map. But we can actually now make maps and look at how they're different. I do want to point out one interesting thing. I drew a little red box over China here. You will see it's sort of important, and then it's really important, and then it sort of dies back out again. So I made a time series of, in essence, that red box's value. Yes? The ends are the number of maps that were a good enough prediction that I wanted to include it. So if it was wildly off on its prediction, I didn't 
I didn't want to know what it learned, what it was using. I only wanted to know what it was using to get a good answer. Does that make sense? But you could also likewise go back and now analyze all the ones it got wrong and say where was it looking incorrectly. Um, okay. So just before I show the time series of this, I want to say that these most these are the reliable indicators of a changing climate, and it's a combination of three things: climate change amplitude, if it's big; internal variability, if it's small and CMIP-5 model agreement. If the models don't agree, it's not useful. Okay, so it's a combination of these three things. And I bet you, given that, you could go without a neural network and spend a day and probably come up with some combination of these fields that gave you similar answers to what I have here. It's just this one maybe a little faster. Okay, so I will um, point out, we saw that the Arctic warms drastically, and it warms the most. But the neural network doesn't use the Arctic very much. Why not? Any guesses? Because it's the same. Because well, but it keeps warming. What area? Variable. It's really variable. Oh. The noise in the Arctic is huge. The signal's huge, but the noise is huge. And on top of the noise being huge, models also disagree a lot with what the Arctic is doing. So it's not very reliable from that standpoint either. And the neural network's like, peace, guys. I'm not going to use it. Right? Like there are a few places it might like, but really it's like I'm not using it. You'll also notice the Enso region. It doesn't really touch because Enso is a big driver of noise. All right, so if we look at this red box, I sort of got ahead of myself here. Yeah. But it's really interesting that later on, once you get revised, it uses it. Then it starts using it, yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of it in there. Nice, yeah, cool. Like 2075. Totally, no, you're totally right. Cool. Um, okay, so let's look at this red box, just because I found this a really interesting example. Um, the red box, this is relevance over this region of China as a function of here. And I'm wondering if this is an aerosol signal coming off of Eastern Asia. Um, because it really, it's not that useful at the end when other things are important. And it's not that useful in the beginning, but right in the middle when we have a very large um, forcing or being input into the models in this region becomes important. And this is, by the way, the question mark there really is a question mark. Just a suggestion. Um, we're still thinking about it. Okay. And, and uh, next, we can say, okay, with OBS, I pushed observations through, and I showed you it did okay. What part of observed temperatures tell it what year? How did it guess the right year for, for observations? We can do the same method. Um, so uh, just to try and orient, this is not the map I input, but to try to help us see where it's warming and where it's cooling. This is the map I input from the year 2000, so this is the 2000 temperature map. But I just subtracted the year 1990 to show you some analysis, just for <coughs> eyes, our eyes. Um, I can show you the real map I input if you care. Okay, and we can then do a relevance propagation. And by the way, it guessed it was 2007. So it's not perfect, we, we knew that already. But these were the regions it really focused on to make that guess. And the Southern Ocean really pops out. It has been very, very consistent. In that. Yeah. I'm still figuring out why. Also off the coast of <coughs> South America, pops out over and over and over and over again. Okay, so, yeah. Sorry, in yeah. terms of, uh, when we're looking at these maps, we're showing in a projection. It's, uh, you don't like my projection? Yeah. It's fine, I'm just okay. saying, does the, does the technique use an area weight? I mean, we're seeing yep. a lot in the Southern Ocean, but really that's a small. It does not, and the thinking was, why, why should I area weight it? it? There's no reason. If it, if it actually thinks all those grid points in the Arctic were important, by all means use it. Um, so we are not, every grid point is a grid point. I mean, we could tweak that, but I, I, I think it would learn if there was an issue with that. Like, it, I don't think we're hurting it by doing it that way. That's my, my guess. Okay. And just pointing out, you can find regions that look like big anomalies in the OBS that weren't used at all in its interpretation, and regions that didn't look that impressive in the OBS, but they were impressive enough to the neural network in a signal to noise sense. Okay. Um, so I have a feeling I'm about to go over time. So I think what I will do is I will skip through a few of the ways we are using this. We're using this for decadal prediction. Um, so I'll skip through. We're using this in terms of thinking about S2S prediction with the MJO. Although um, this is, all these people are not working on neural networks. All these people are part of a team that have been looking at, at the MJO and sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction and we're thinking how can we utilize these methods. Specifically, I've done some work looking at if we can predict, say, extreme precip here, 
using inputs of OLR, so outgoing long wave radiation in the tropics, what parts of the MJO were the most important in giving me predictability, and are those regions associated with, say, <coughs> Rossby wave um, uh, excitation? So we can get to dynamics. Okay, so I want to end with my little robot thing above the earth here. Okay, so challenges for machine learning for geosciences. Our spatial temporal structure, you cannot get rid of it, it makes our data complicated and interesting. High dimensionality, there's so many variables. Lack of concise object definition. We're not even that sure what an atmospheric river might be, right? Let alone how we're going to train a neural network to find one. Um, uh, paucity of ground truth in some case, or truth. We have to tell it when it's wrong so it can learn, but we need to know when it's wrong in the first place. Um, small sample sizes, but unlike mainstream applications, geoscience phenomena are governed by physical laws and principles. Yeah. And notice how mass conservation never went into my, my setup here. And that makes a lot of scientists uncomfortable. What we're, do what we're doing is throwing out hundreds of years of physics and saying, pretend we know nothing, let's just push it through a black box and see what the answer is. But there is a big push right now for what's called physics-guided machine learning, which is how can we incorporate physical laws we know to the neural network, for example, so it doesn't have to search everywhere out of the state space. It can zone in on the places that are physical, okay? For example, if I were to make some prediction, but I told you mass wasn't conserved, you probably wouldn't be that excited about whatever the prediction was, okay? And so people are incorporating physics into the model by penalizing it for breaking physical laws. It shows up in the loss function. Um, also building it into the prediction itself. And there's been some new work showing this actually makes the neural network do a much better job and not overfit. All right, so final slide here. Um, so the rapid rise of machine learning methods, I'd say, has brought the age-old trade-off between physics-based and data-oriented methods. And this is one of the reasons I find this very interesting, is this, we have these different types of scientists at play here. Um, and thoughtful use is essential for quality science, and I can talk more about this, but I think our field is up for the challenge of doing quality science, because I think we all tweak parameters and make decisions with big data every day. We're already doing this. This is just another tool. Um, machine learning offers additional tools for the job. I'm not trying to say we don't have a job, okay? Um, but I think it's, a, it's a, another tool that we could use when we think it's relevant. And I do, the point of this talk is really to say it can be used for more than just prediction. I give you an example where I don't care about the prediction. What I cared about is how it made the prediction. And I think if you leave with nothing else, maybe you can think about your own research and there is a way to twist your problem so the inner workings of that, that black box, which you can now open, if you will, are, are what's important. Um, so with that, I'll end with some questions you should ask yourself before you do this. Thank you. So, on your first slide, uh -huh. you had said at the very beginning that um, you viewed this as an interdisciplinary type of problem. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so, the question I have is, we use, you know, our students take lots of calculus and physics before yeah. they enter the major, and but we don't consider what we do with the calculus and physics as interdisciplinary. It's part of our, it's part of what yeah. we do, it's part of the tool. Yeah. <laughs> so, looking at your talk here, it seems as though this could eventually become part of our toolkit. And at what stage do you think the techniques you talked about are going to become just sort of the bread and butter, how we, part of how we do our science. Yeah, um, I could and even put it, I think it's in a matter of maybe two years, three years. I think students are going to eat this stuff up and be like, you know, even if their advisor's like, ah, oh, you don't need that, they're going to say, this is the world we live in now. Um, I will say, this project, we have an interdisciplinary team, and this is something Emma and my colleague and I disagree a little bit about. I would say that the computer science side was really days one through ten. Most of what we're doing here is out of the box, three lines of code in Google Keras. It's not hard. And the hard part is the interpretation, which we're all very used to. So in that sense, for my application, I don't think it needs to be interdisciplinary anymore. I think this is something just climate people can do. With that said, when you start doing physics-guided machine learning and thinking about changing the architecture, you, we don't have, I don't have the training, a computer science background, to really understand how one choice will affect another, will affect another. And so in that sense, I think if you're interested in this, in, in honing 
something, you know, building a machine that doesn't exist already, you're going to have to have those, those cross collaborations. Um, I do worry a little bit, though, that there are really stupid things you could do if you just write three lines of code and push your data through it. And, and I benefited greatly from having this, this broader network to, to, to say these stupid ideas to and be quickly shut down. Um, but I, I have a big passion for teaching data analysis to climate and atmospheric, atmospheric scientists. I think that's so important. I think it should be required everywhere. And I, just like we require dynamics, I think it should be at, at the same level, if not more. Because I would argue that there are some people that maybe don't have to think about large scale dynamics, but everybody has to think about data in this day and age. Um, so in that sense, I think, I think if we don't give it to students, they're going to be yelling at us for it over just a, a few more years. Yeah. The, uh, the Southern Ocean yeah. signature is really interesting. It, it, and it, I don't remember whether you had Southern Ocean as one of your classes where you looked at how quickly they emerged. I didn't. No, I started, I kept big, and actually the Southern Ocean, this has been done in sections, so I have not done that yet. So one question would be, is the Southern Ocean giving us most of that yeah. signal? Yeah. And does it say, if you go back and look at your, your observation one, the yeah. places where people have done field campaigns to look at process studies for climate change yep. are not the Southern Ocean. No. Should we, is that where we should be? Because, yeah. because there's less variance or what? It's those three things I said. Well, first, models have to agree on it, which is something a little weird that maybe isn't looked at. People often look at signal to noise. But the data is showing this. But the way. data is showing this. Yes, so one could use this method to try and outline where to look, just like, say, an adjoint method could help you see what's, where errors need to be fixed or a, you, know, you need a balloon to be launched. Um, <coughs> yeah, so with that, I don't know yet. One could use this for that, but I would say, obviously we want more than just my one study to suggest mm -hmm. we should send a big ship or something out into the Southern Ocean. And are these all, these are coupled models. These There's are coupled. something about the ocean circulation mm -hmm. that the Southern Ocean unifies all the basins, right? Yeah, I've, I've been interpreting this as not the ocean itself, but clouds? Uh, clouds. I feel like that's a safe answer here. Is that <laughs> clouds, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just, I have no idea. Um, I will say that I thought, so ozone depletion and recovery has been thought to be the biggest driver of change over the past few decades. And that signal is in the Southern Ocean in sort of an annular sense like we saw. I do wonder how much that's ozone, except if it was ozone, I would have thought it would follow some sort of time series of ozone depletion and recovery. And I don't see that. I see it become important and stay important for a long time, which is why I'm hesitant to act on it. This is one of those cases where I had a hypothesis, a hypothesis and I'm not actually sure if it's right. Yeah. So I'm sorry I can't give you my answers. <coughs> I'll let Steph uh, making enemies. Yeah. One thing I'm sort of puzzled about is yeah. what uh, the complexity of the learning system has to do with the complexity of what you put into it. Okay. Two layers of 10 neurons each seems like a pretty minimal system. Yep. And you're putting in lots of points yep. and you're inferring lots of relevance. And I just wondered yeah, yeah, no, that's a great how point. many training cases do you need for you know yeah. the complexity of the network and things. Can you just say something more about that? Yeah, so how much data do I need to find my signal is one of the holy grail questions I think of computer science right now of machine learning. Another is um, what should my architecture be? How many layers? How many nodes each? And that's also somewhat unknown. I will tell you, I, you pointed out something actually really important that I, also, I glossed over completely, which is I am inputting something like 40,000 points and I am making a prediction of one thing. It, you should be like, why aren't you overfitting to you know, the nth degree? And the answer is I am using um, Ridge or L2 regularization. I am not allowing it to use every point individually, but it has to pull points together. And, and so if you're familiar with these techniques, if I don't do that, I will get perfect predictions on everything from my training data. So um, the way we found, however, so applications, why did I choose two layers of 10 nodes? I did it lots of different ways, which is the computer science version of trial and error, okay? And after about two layers of 10 nodes each, I got no additional bang for my buck. It just took longer to train, and I did just as well. 
So I did, just like with lots of tuning of different dynamical models, you have to be careful with training and testing and making sure you're choosing your parameters carefully. Um, so that doesn't really answer your question, but it's currently my understanding is it's mostly trial and error, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable. So kind of the follow-up of that and yeah. thinking about noise and grid models, mm -hmm. have you tried downscaling the data to how big could your grids be yeah. in order for the signal to appear? To yeah, that's awesome. I haven't, but I've thought about that. I have zoomed in on regions and said, what if I only looked at North America? Can I find any pattern at all? But I haven't started averaging grid boxes to say how big do they have to be. I have started playing with averaging and time. So instead of 1923, it's 1920 to 1930 is the average. And so, Surprisingly, I thought it would just be amazing because I'm averaging out and so's and anything longer, like shorter than a decade, it's going to rock it. But actually, it did almost as well in terms of all of my error metrics as this one, so as it's this version. And I think the reason is we still have quite a bit of noise across models that isn't that isn't being averaged out when I average in time. Um, that's yeah. There's so many fun things. We can do. That's a great idea. Yeah, this is really excellent, with you. I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different ways, but ignorant in more. Um, but I'm interested in the following question. There seems to be a tension amongst people who do numerical weather prediction to keep making higher and higher resolution models and doing all these things to change the model constantly. Okay. And yet your, the use of prior work in numerical weather prediction seems to be, from the machine learning point of view or artificial intelligence, would seem to want to have the longest possible time series with somewhat frozen models okay. to get something out of that. Uh -huh. Do you see that as a danger for application of this for set of tools to numerical weather predictions specifically, not so much climate models? Whoa, that's a, that's a great question. Um, if you're trying to use the output of NWP like we talked about a few hours ago, but like yeah. your sort of adjoint method, but now use it here, mm -hmm. then yes. Because ultimately, you're, you want to learn about the system you have in that software package called Wharf right now. Right. You don't want to know about the version that it had five years ago. So in that sense, yes, perhaps that's where retrospective forecasts would, would be a must, yeah. is if you have the system that you have, now you're going to have to go back and do everything <coughs> over. Do all these reforecasts. Just so yeah. we have something to train <coughs> um, Because unlike with the CMF5 models with NWP, we keep the hope is we keep improving. So why would you want the network to learn something that was old and, if you will, worse? Whereas yeah. with the CMIT 5 models, we're not sure who's better and who's worse per se. Yeah. So we might as well throw it all in. Yeah, it strikes um, me that it's similar yeah. to trying to watch an NFL game, watch the penalties called, and then try to decide what year the game was being played. Because the <laughs> rules are changed every yeah. single yeah. year, and, and you can't figure out where you are in the yeah. rule book. And, so I, and maybe that's the same problem, right? I will say in NWP, though, there are so many. And if you try to set it up the way I'm doing it, then yeah, that's a problem. But NWP has so many ways you could use this. Mm. Like um, yeah. a big way is like a uh, student that Russ Schumacher had in my group was all about post-processing dynamical forecasts of, of precipitation. Mm. So we have all these forecasts. We already have post-processing techniques. But now let's utilize um, a decision tree or a random forest to actually help us make use of those in the right way. How do, who do we weight more and less yeah. in showing that it did pretty well. Mm. So I think there's so many other ways to use it. Um, David John Gagne used it to look at hail, for, uh, hail forecasts, but he had enough forecasts of hail over, say, the US over just a few years that he didn't need, say, 30 years of data yeah, to learn right. something. So I think right. it's about the problem set. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. So you have for the backwards propagation of oh, the relevance. Yeah. Okay. Have, uh, 1923, just one year or well, one number for the input. And yeah. A whole bunch of numbers. <laughs> yeah. Can you say more about the algorithm for going? going yeah. Back? So I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of things. So um, I'm going to change your question. Okay. okay. So technically, LRP, so layerwise relevance propagation, has been mostly uh, it's introduced in computer science a few years ago. And one of the big hot things, but they have only shown that it works for classification problems. What that means is you have, say, two different classes. I have many different classes. Class 1 is 1920, class 2 is 1921, class 3 is 1922, class 4. And it ends up putting, you could think of it as, probability that it exists in one of those classes. 
So it puts a lot of weight on, say, 1950, but there's a little in 1949 and 1951 because it's not really sure which one it is. And what this method does is it takes that highest probability. Let's say the highest probability is a 51% probability that it's 1950. It takes that value of 0.51, and it goes backwards and says how much of 0.51 came from this guy and this guy, and it divvies it up based on the weights. Okay, And then you have those two values, so it got split into, say, 0.41 and 0.1. Oh, this is going to be too fast. Okay. And then it takes this and says, how much of that came from these other nodes? Okay, let's divvy that up based on the weights. And it goes all the way backwards until that 0.51 is distributed across all of the grid points. Does that make some sense? Okay, and the idea is there's conservation happening. <coughs> you make sure that whatever that output was was conserved. So when you get to the beginning and you add everything up, it's the same, same as what you were chopping into pieces. You're in essence taking a pie and chopping it up into pieces of the pie for where they came from. Okay, um, that's how it's typically been used. Does that help? Uh, sorry, okay, not so much. All right, I try. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's think. Thank you.